Jessica Knapp, and I'm the Online Engagement Coordinator at Canada's History Society, and I will be your host for tonight's webinar. This is the second last webinar of Canada's History's Historic Venues webinar series, and it has been a pleasure to host, and tonight will be no different. Tonight, Dr. Deborah Nash Chambers will discuss how Guelph remembers, that's Guelph, Ontario, remembers Lieutenant Colonel John McRae and the legacy of In Flanders Fields. We just passed the 100th anniversary of In Flanders Fields, and for those of you who are unaware, Guelph, Ontario is the birthplace of John McRae. So it's very important for that community to play a significant role in commemoration. But before I hand everything over to Deb, I'm going to say a few things about Canada's History Society. We are a national charitable organization dedicated to making Canadian history popular for a general audience. We do this in a number of ways, including our flagship publications, one of which is Canada's Histories Magazine, formerly known as The Beaver, and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids. Canada's History is also responsible for awarding the Governor General's History Awards, as well as a few others. In particular today, I'm going to talk to you about Can the Governor General's History Award for Community Programming. This award aims to inspire small volunteer-led community organizations in the creation of innovative programming that commemorates unique aspects of our heritage. Each year, two projects are awarded $2,500 and a trip for two to Ottawa to receive their award at the Governor General's History Awards at Rideau Hall. The deadline for this award is August 1st. So if you're, you think you have a project that you want to consider submitting for this award, don't hesitate to contact me and ask a few questions. Uh, read over the application and see if it's right for, for your group. You can access the information about this award and our other awards through the link on the screen at the moment. So just a few reminders before we get going tonight. Um, to help everything go smoothly, I recommend closing down applications that you don't need open. So Photoshop, iMovie, if you're on a Mac or a PC, um, even Microsoft Word if you're not using it, if you have a lot of tabs open in your browser, I recommend taking some time right now, bookmarking them and opening them up at a later time. If you do have any trouble tonight, um, technology-wise, we are recording the webinar and it should be available most likely at the beginning of next week on our YouTube channel. So, and if you have registered for the webinar, you will receive an email when that video becomes available. I would also like to encourage those who are here tonight to spread the word about tonight's chat on social media. So I've included our Twitter handle and our Facebook link. So if you haven't followed or liked those, those plat us on those platforms yet, now is a great time to do that because it's really it's uh, available for you. You just click on the link on the screen and it will take you right to the page. If you do have any questions during the webinar, feel free to write them in the chat window and send them so Deb can read them and she can decide whether she wants to address them during her presentation or come back to them at the end. It is her discretion and whichever will interrupt the uh, flow of the presentation less. So don't be insulted if she doesn't answer it right away. I'm sure she will get to them. I also wanted to, one last thing, um, I will be sending out a sur feedback survey about the tonight's webinar. So if you are here live tonight, um, go ahead and fill that out. You will, if you've registered, I will send it to you in an email. I will also include a link in the chat closer to the end of tonight's webinar. You can access it there as well. 
So without further ado, I am going to load the next PowerPoint presentation. And Deb, I would welcome you to introduce yourself. from the Guelph Civic Museum. Welcome to the presentation. Greetings from the Guelph Civic Museum. And We are broadcasting from the window beside the glass box on the top floor of the beautiful, renovated Guelph Civic Museum that was a former Loretto convent. This evening, I'd like to talk about Guelph and how it remembers Lieutenant Colonel John McRae and the legacy of his famous poem in Flanders Fields. As Jessica pointed out already, this past Sunday, May the 3rd, was the 100th anniversary of John McRae's best-known poem in Flanders Fields. And following the publication of McRae's poem in the English magazine Punch in December of 1915, the image of blood-red poppies amid crosses marking the graves of the fallen resonated both with civilians and the military in the Allied countries. The poem was written following the Second Battle of Ypres in Belgium, where poppies bloomed amid the carnage of war. In the years following the Great War, the poppy became an international symbol of remembrance and commemoration. And today, the poem and the poppy remain symbols of remembrance and commemoration in Canada and beyond our borders. On Sunday, the Guelph Civic Museum hosted a video link to Ypres, Belgium, to exchange greetings between the Guelph's mayor, Cam Guthrie, and the mayor of Ypres. Maureen Harper, wife of the Canadian Prime Minister, spoke from Belgium to honor McRae, the centenary of the poem, and its international legacy. This event is one of many planned by a local task force struck 18 months ago for Flanders Fields at 100. The objective is to carry the torch by reflecting on all facets of McRae's life, as well as honoring his poem. The task force wants to heighten the awareness of and appreciation for John McRae and his Guelph roots during the 2015 festivities. As it was pointed out by Jessica earlier, McRae was born and raised in Guelph before he belonged to Toronto, Montreal, and then to the world. This year, a full calendar of events has been planned in Guelph to commemorate the 100th anniversary of McRae's famous poem and to remember the man, doctor, soldier, and poet. Members of the Canadian military over several generations, and, and the Canadian public in general, are very familiar with the following lines composed by Dr. McRae while he was serving overseas in 1915. In Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe, to you with failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders field. These three poignant verses comprise the poem that became one of the most widely known poems of the First World War and perhaps the best-known Canadian poem of the time. In his impressive monograph, Death So Noble, Memory, Meaning, in the First World War, Jonathan Vance very succinctly notes the impact of the poem. He states, and I quote, John McRae, the proud son of Guelph, Ontario, was thrust to the forefront of Canada's war myth, unquote. In a similar vein, in We Throw the Torch, Alan R. Young notes that McRae's poem, quote, stuck in popular memory, unquote and therefore became a feature of remembrance ceremonies thereafter. To this day, the wearing of poppies is a ritual of remembrance of past wars and also the sacrifice of those in uniform. The national commemorative importance of the poem was underscored when lines from McCray's poem were chosen to be engraved in the memorial chapter, chapel chamber rather, of Ottawa's Peace Tower. 2015 marks the 100th anniversary of the writing and the publication of McRae's In Flanders Fields. 
McCray, soldier, doctor, and poet, and his three famous uh, verses of poetry are once again thrust into the national spotlight. Guelph's beloved son and his poem in Flanders Fields will be memorialized and commemorated in a series of local civil civic events beginning with the current juried art show on at the Guelph Civic Museum and the reopening of the newly renovated McCray House Museum this past week. Uh, on the weekend, on May 2nd, we had a, a soft opening and a visit from the Remembrance Lodge in Toronto. The lodge was formed in 1920 by veterans of the First World War, and they still recite the poem in Flanders Fields before their lodge ceremonies every time they meet, and they also uh, come up every year and visit the McCray House and uh, pay respect to McCray and the poem, and we very much enjoyed hosting them this past weekend. On June 25th, the bronze statue of Major McCray, he was Major McCray at the time that he composed the poem. Uh, the statue, a bronze statue uh, showing him composing the poem will be unveiled on the grounds of the Guelph Civic Museum. The Guelph statue is a twin to the statue that was unveiled in Ottawa on Sunday, May 3rd. Uh, they were commissioned works by Canadian sculptor Ruth Abernethy. In Guelph, local th philanthropists, various civic organizations, local businesses, and individual citizens became very active in supporting the fundraising efforts for the statue. And the money was relatively easily raised so that by February of this year, they had already reached the 300,000 mark that they needed to not only pay for the commission statue, but for the transportation and for installation. Further events coordinated by Guelph's and Flanders Field at 100 Task Force are going to be rolled out until December 2015. And by 20, the end of 2015, Guelphites and visitors will have numerous opportunities to become more familiar with McCray's personal history and also the impact of his poem. In a televised Heritage Minute dedicated to McCray entitled In Flanders Fields, the companionate, intelligent, I think attractive McCray was portrayed by a well-known Canadian star of stage and film, Colm Fior. Ironically, the original televised version of the vignette identified McCray as being from Montreal and just Montreal. Well, Guelphites protested. Uh, the protest was spearheaded by MP Brenda Chamberlain and Guelph's Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 234. But it also had a lot of support from the community, from organizations like the Guelph Historical Society, and just individual members of the public at large. Uh, due to the protest, the spot was redubbed to include the statement that McCray was born and raised in Guelph, and we're not going to let people forget that this year. Unfortunately, the scriptwriter and the producer of the Heritage uh, Minute not only overlooked the real true beginnings of McCray and where he was from, they seemingly were unaware that his family home on Water Street in Guelph was adjacent to a war memorial and a commemorative garden that dated back from 1946. McCray House, the monument and the gardens are under the conservatorship of Guelph Civic Museums in the city of Guelph at the present time. The exterior of McCray House, the house in which McCray was born, has been restored to circa 1872 when he was born in the house and collectively the monument, the gardens, and McCray House comprise a national historic site. Records indicate that every year over a thousand visitors, many of them from overseas, visit McCray House and the memorial gardens and join the commemoration of the man and, the, and his poem. A lot of Dutch visitors and, and or visitors from the Netherlands and also visitors from Belgium visit McCray House in addition to other uh, people from other nations as well as those from across Canada. So it's very nice to see that there's such a wide appreciation for the life of McCrae and the legacy of his poem. In November, remembrance services are he held with the War Memorial as a focal point for a very solemn occasion. Students from the John McCrae Elementary School down the street join the veterans and members of Guelph's John McCrae Legion, military cadets, civic officials, and the general public for outdoor remembrance services. And despite the weather changes that happen at that time of year, the remembrance service goes on, rain or shine. The solemnity of November, the National Historic Site, suits not only 
recurring status within Canada's mythology of World War One, and I think it suits the respect due to all who died and all who served in the Canadian Armed Forces as well. It is befitting the memorialization of a staunch Presbyterian from a proud military family, and McCray was certainly that. Now, in contrast, in the summer, the memorial gardens are host to museum programs for young and old, and they range from teas and picnics to weekly performances by the Guelph Pipe Band. The repurposing of the historic site over the calendar year would intrigue Guelph's favorite son. He was a born bon vivant and had a celebrated sense of humor. In his eulogy tribute to his friend, John McNaughton recalled that McCray's fun had a very fun-loving nature and uh, was great fun to be around and very much someone who was invited to dinner parties because of it. He was always the good person to have at the table to keep things lively. McNaughton recalled, and I quote, full of humor, he always was always ready for enjoyment himself, highly capable of ministering to the gaiety of others, and fond of all things worthwhile. Unquote. Personally, I've always had a respect and a fond regard for McRae. Having worked on projects for the task force over the last 18 months, I've discovered that McRae is a figure from the past that I really would have liked to have been able to meet, and not just because he's a very attractive man. So who was the man behind the poem? McRae, to me, epitomized the sense of duty to family, community, and country that we now call public service or, in modern parlance, paying it back. While a keen sense of responsibility and duty to God and family and country was quite typical of well-bred, respectable Canadian man of his era, McCray overcame obstacles in his life and remained loyal to all three of what he perceived to be his duties in life. The McCray family emigrated from Scotland. They were Presbyterian heritage. John McCray's grandfather, Thomas McCray, was a wealth entrepreneur who opened a sawmill and also a woolen mill. John's father, David, worked for the grandfather and later became a farmer and cattle breeder. Now David McRae was dedicated to serving in the militia and the defense of the British Empire. And these were aspirations and responsibilities that he very much tried to ingrain in his son, John McRae. John was brought up to share these interests and in balance, he received more of a soft, introspective side from his mother. His mother, Janet, was the daughter of a minister, and Janet helped her son form a deep and abiding faith, and this sustained John through his medical career and his military service, both in Africa and in Europe. At home, the family read the Bible, and they also attended church every week, as most people would do in that time and place. The family sat in their own special pew in St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church every Sunday. If you have an opportunity to visit Guelph and to visit the church, the McRae pew is still marked with a, a, a brass marker that's up near the front of the church. Janet McRae gave the security of a mother's unquestioning love. She also gave John an appreciation for books and poetry and a curiosity that fed his passion for literature, nature, and learning. John was someone who loved to learn and loved to have a very varied background in what he was absorbing and learning as he grew up. Even when separated from his mother and his father and his siblings, his brother Thomas and sister Giles, John McCrae dutifully and lovingly carried on a voluminous correspondence. And many of these letters are preserved at the archives of the Guelph Civic Museum. John was a very dutiful son. He wrote his mother twice a week. And even when he was overseas during the First World War, he wrote playful, caring notes to his sister's children. John McRae's letters are wonderfully magic. He has such a, a gift for language and a wonderful sense of humor that comes out in the letters. And you would enjoy reading them as much as I have. Along with many skillfully executed sketches this collection and this collection of letters, uh, a treasure trove of memorabilia about John McRae and his family is available in the Hugh Guthrie archives of the Guelph Civic Museum. Now, John McRae was an asthmatic, and he didn't let that hold him back in life. He challenged himself by playing a variety of sports in his youth and while at the University of Toronto. 
McCray adapted to the physical challenges of drills and actual battles faced by all soldiers when he was serving in Africa in the Second African War, or as it's also known, the Second Boer War. And this also occurred, of course, with terrible battlefield conditions and uh, terrible hospital conditions when he was serving in Europe during World War I. His brilliance was profoundly displayed throughout his medical career. He made wonderful contributions to civilian medicine as well as medicine in the battlefront. And he overall made contributions as an educator, a clinician, a pathologist, an author, a medical author, and a battle, as also as a battlefield surgeon. But what intrigues me most about McCray's fabled is his fabled sense of humor and his storytelling skills. I, I enjoy people who have a sense of humor and also have the ability to tell a story well. It's been speculated that McCray was chosen to be the doctor to accompany Governor General Lord Grey's expedition to Hudson's Bay in August of 1910 because he was so good natured. He could tell such good stories. And there was also the issue of the fact that he was a very fine do doctor, so he was. Uh, invited also for his very good medical talents. The Governor General later mused that McCray, a captivating raconteur as I've indicated, had a tale for each of the 3,000 miles that they traveled. It must have been a very interesting ex expedition. All in all, McCray was a multi-dimensional man with a very complex history and I hope that I'm able to express that to you this evening. Following his death in January of 1918, the local paper, the Guelph Herald, Guelph had two papers back then, the Guelph Herald and the Guelph Mercury. The Guelph Herald regaled McCray's many attributes and interests. The newspaper paid tribute to him in this way upon his death. Quote, Dr. John McCray was an unusual man, possessed of a strong mind, had a keen sense of duty, a patriot in every sense of the meaning of the word, a brainy man, one who led a clean life, whose example could be an example to others, a brave man, and one who would not hesitate at anything which he felt was right. The Dominion of Canada and the British nation could ill afford to spare him at this time." Unquote. John McCrae's sense of duty to country shaped his medical career and interrupted it as well. He interrupted his medical career training to follow fellow Guelph volunteers overseas during the Boer War. And despite having established a civilian medical career upon his return to Canada in 1901, he returned to active service with immediacy when war was declared in 1914. As a surgeon and a soldier, McCray understood the horror of war. So to perceive his famous poem as a glorification of war, I think, is to oversimplify the poem and to really not understand the context and the meaning. The horror of the Honorable uh, William Wangard, and who was a former MP, a former president of the University of Guelph, and also a member of the Privy Council in the Order of Canada, I, Dr. Wangard's also a decorated uh, naval veteran. He's warned Canadians not to forget that McCrae was a humanitarian ref when reflecting on McCrae's military service and his famous poem in Flanders Fields. He, along with Lieutenant Colonel McCrae, K of Guelph's 11th Field Regiment have been instrumental in bringing the statue to Guelph. Colonel McKay, Lieutenant Colonel McKay also asserts that those attempting to understand McCray should appreciate, quote, that he saw the human side of war and the First World War was quite tragic, unquote. Well, sadly, McCray died from a pneumonia at Boulogne, France on January 28, 1918. I think it's important to ponder several questions to fully appreciate the personal journey that led McCray to becoming not only Canada's most celebrated soldier poet, but an internationally remembered figure who's been immortalized by, by a revered poem. So how did John McCray, from a small city in Ontario, become such an important figure in our national meta-narrative of na military service and commemoration during and following the Great War? And secondly, why was a doctor with a reputation for brilliance and with a distinguished career in Montreal so wedded to military service? On May 3, 1915, when McCrae composed in Flanders Fields, he held the rank of Major and he was 2nd in Command and Brigade Surgeon, 1st Brigade Canadian Field Artillery. An unpublished retrospective 
that uh, is available through the archives at the Guelph Soap Museum was written by C.L. C. Allenson. It's titled John McCrae, Poet, Soldier, Physician, and it provides some interesting information. Allenson was first in command as Brigade Sergeant, 1st Brigade, Canadian Artillery, and he recalls watching McCrae writing in Flanders Fields. Now, there are a lot of myths about how the poem was written, that it was jotted down on a piece of paper and thrown away and someone else picked it up and sent it in. But I think I would rather rely on what Allenson has to say because he was there when the poem was being written. McCrae suffered the loss of a very dear friend, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, at the height of the Second Battle of Ypres. And a grieving McCrae was inspired to create the poem in response to Helmer's very brutal death. Allison dedicates his own manuscript to Helmer, and he says, and I quote, without whom in Flanders Fields would not have been written, unquote. The connection between the McCrae family and military service began with David McCrae, John's father. John's father furthers his own reputation in the community when he joined the 47th Foot Lancashire Regiment in Hamilton in 1865. It was a time when a Fenian invasion uh, was anticipated. The British colonies were considered to be soft targets. The Fenians were demobilized veterans of the American Civil War. They had military skills and knew how to handle weapons. And they decided that they would get organized and invade Canada to try and get back at Britain for their treatment of Ireland. And so McCrae went off to war. Guelph was actually on alert at this time. Uh, in 1866, the news was received in Guelph, Ontario, that there was going to be perhaps an invasion through Niagara. And uh, David McCrae and others took off by train to wait things out to see what happened. McCrae earned a second class officer certificate and that made David McCrae qualified to join Guelph's Wellington Rifles as a drill instructor in 1866 and he rose to the rank of captain. Leo Johnson notes in his History of Guelph 1827 to 1927 that in 1878 McCrae commanded a section of the Ontario Agricultural College based Ontario Field Battery. Years later, Major David McRae and the Interior Veterinary College helped to supply horses to volunteer forces that served in the Boer War. Then, remarkably, at age 71, David McRae showed his dedication to service. The Guelph Mercury, the other paper, began reporting on David McRae's efforts to organize the 43rd Battery Canadian Field Regiment in the fall of 1915. Now, McCrae, at the age of 71, traveled to England with his men in 1916. But he was quite disappointed to find out that he was declared too old to proceed to the front in France along with his men to, to quote unquote, take in his battles. Well, with this background that of his father and his connection to the military, it's not surprising that 14 year old John McCrae first courted his own decision to join the Guelph Collegiate. Institute's Highland Cadets. Young McCrae joined as Cadet Lieutenant McCrae. Back in the days of the drill teams that were military drill teams in Guelph Collegiate Vocational Institute and other uh, institutes of higher learning and secondary education in Guelph and other places, these drill teams were part of the effort to keep young men fit. But they were also precision drill teams that would go out into the community and if there was a banquet they would put on a precision drill or if there were outdoor activities that were being celebrated in the community they would also be invited to uh, come and to perform. And McCrae eventually won uh, awards for being the best drill ready cadet. The following year he became a bugler in the Wellington Rifles. His affiliation with the Guelph Battery continued after his enrollment in the BA program at the U of T at age 16. So he was quite prepared to carry on in the militia in Guelph and then take those activities with him to university. I should also point out that McCrae, was deemed to his keen intellect, was always at the top of his class in high school, but he also won a full scholarship to attend U of T. 
At age 18, McCray was a gunner, and three years later he received a commission in the artillery as second lieutenant and number two battery, a provisional first brigade, field artillery, Guelph. On campus in Toronto, he joined the K Company of the Queen's Own Rifles. And while he was involved with the Queen's Own Rifles, he achieved the rank of company captain of the Varsity Company in 1892 at just 20 years of age. When the Boer War began, he delayed his medical studies and volunteered to serve overseas with men from Guelph. McCray and his fellow volunteers from Guelph sailed from Canada on February 1900, and they formed part of the D Battery organized in Ottawa. Lieutenant McCray was in charge of number two section, and he was very well respected by his men. Uh, McNaughton reflected on his friend's military service and said, Quote, between becoming a soldier and a good one, joined, joining our overseas troops at that time as lieutenant of artillery, he saw a great deal of service at Belfast, Lindenburg, and some 18 other places, won the Queen's Medal in th with three clasps, and rose to the rank of major commanding the 16th Battery in the Canadian Field Artillery. He was a brave, capable, and highly intelligent officer, unquote. Lieutenant Colonel McCrae was a doctor serving in the artillery when he went to war in 1914. So it was just in the last two and a half years of his life that he served exclusively in the Canadian Medical Corps. Obviously, McCrae's military interests were not exclusive interests. He pursued university studies in Toronto from age 16 to 21, except for a brief, ill fated sojourn teaching at the Ontario Agricultural College in Guelph uh, for a year. His age was a liability, and it made, him very, it made it very difficult for him to earn respect. Many of his students were older than him or the same age. And disgruntled soldiers or students threw him in a pond because he was late for dinner one night, so they hardly accorded him the respect that other uh, people teaching at the OAC would have had at the time. On the other hand, his teaching experience in this non-military environment uh, told him it was time to go back to school. McCray excelled as a professor later in his life at McGill. He was someone that uh, was very uh, brilliant in the way he taught students, and he had a fine reputation. So obviously he had learned from his earlier mistakes in Guelph. After graduating with a Bachelor of Arts and Natural Science degree, McCray started a medical degree at the U of T, and that was completed in 1898. Like his older brother Thomas, he established an exemplary medical career. They're both brilliant men. In 1898, the younger McCray accepted an internship at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, before taking up his fellowship he was awarded in Montreal. Now, John was instructed and mentored by Dr. Osler, who was one of the men who had a very fine reputation for medicine throughout North America. They established a long and abiding friendship. McCray began a governor's fellowship in pathology at McGill under another very brilliant man, a professor J.D. Adami, in 1901 when he returned from the Boer War. In Montreal, McCray served as a resident pathologist at the Montreal General Hospital in 1902, and he became a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1904. When he, at this time, he was an associate in medicine at Royal Victoria Hospital. He later went on to become a physician at the Royal Alexander Hospital for Infectious Diseases in 1908, and then a lecturer in medicine at McGill in 1909. Until 1911, McCray served as a visiting professor of pathology at the University of Vermont, and he traveled to Vermont by train once a month for many years. The obviously tireless Dr. McCray worked as a pathologist at the Montreal General Hospital, and he also, on top of all of this, operated a private practice. Now, it's been reported that in his career, McCray carried out 400 autopsies, which is a monumental feat in itself. McCray was a published poet since 1894, and McCray also authored medical articles. He had 300 medicine-related publications that included articles documenting the 1908 scarlet fever outbreak in Montreal. And these articles were published in journals such as the Montreal Medical Journal and the Maritime Medical News. They also included submissions to the American Journal of Medical Abstracts. In 1912, he co-authored a pathology test with Dr. Adami. 
But all these responsibilities were set aside very quickly when Britain and Canada entered the Great War in 1914. At the time, McCrae was in England, and he made arrangements to return to Canada and enlist as quickly as possible. Now, he decided not to go to Guelph to visit his mother because he felt it might be too much for her. But having studied the letters and McCrae himself, I imagine this would have been a very difficult thing for him to do as well as to see his mother when he was going away to war for a second time. After training at Valcarche in Quebec, he went to war as a surgeon in the 1st Brigade Artillery. At the time, he was 41 years old, and his medical skills were needed on the battlefield. He also took the position that it was the duty of bachelors to go and fight and to go and serve so that mammoth families would not have to be called up so soon or be called upon so soon. And so when he went off to war, he not only had medical duties, but he also had military duties with the artillery. He was at the Second Back Battle of Ypres in Belgium as it raged on from the 22nd of April to May 25th in 1915. And after suffering tremendous losses of men and artillery, the forces under McCrae's medical purview were relieved from the position on the battles of the Yser Canal finally. And it has been described by McCrae and others as 17 days of hell. McCrae watched men succumb to the chlorine gas that had been weaponized by the Germans and used against the Allied troops for the first time in this battle. And there are stories of McCrae watching people uh, fall in battle, uh, stopping uh, and dropping as they were going to take messages to other parts of the front. And even there were men who staggered to the top of the hill. His medical bunker was at the bottom of the hill at the canal, and they were rolling down the hill overcome with wounds and also with gas. McCrae assisted with the artillery operations when needed, so he interrupted his medical uh, assistance to wounded and dying men to also take part in anything necessary as far as artillery operations were concerned. And I think that's the ultimate in multitasking. McCrae's compatriots at the front, including Allison, witnessed the death of Lieutenant Alexis Helmer on May 2nd, 1915, as I said. Now, the gruesome death of his friend not only inspired McCrae's poem in Flanders Fields, it marked a significant change in McCrae's once effervescent demeanor in the, despite the realities of war. He was always someone who tried to encourage people around him to persevere, and he always tried to uh, keep spirits high with some sort of... Uh, joke or revelry, but after this battle he started to very much age and he also seemed to be uh, very much feeling the realities of war. Someone was going to see him on a leave uh, sometime later in London and because of the tremendous impact of what he was facing overseas, uh, they didn't recognize McCray at first until they got closer. Well, little was left to bury his friend, of his friend when Lieutenant Helmer took a direct hit from an 8-inch shell. Uh, men went around and gathered up what bits and pieces they could find. Uh, the remnants of Helmer were sewn into a sandbag. The sandbag was laid to rest. And McCrae, who had been a very religious man all his life, had a tremendous memory, actually conducted the committal service uh, for his friend from memory that day. The next day, McCrae, soldier, physician, and poet, penned in Flanders Fields. It would be seven months before the poem was published in Punch. It was originally objected by, rejected by the first magazine to which it was submitted. And McCrae's international notoriety would then begin after Punch published his poem. McCrae's war service continued, uh, but there were changes that came after the events of May. I, as I said, McCrae was exhausted and disheartened. He wasn't particularly happy with a, a new challenge in June 1915, when he became a lieutenant colonel at number three Canadian General Hospital. At the time, he felt they really could better serve at the front lines, but he was needed at the hospital back of the lines. For the first time, McCrae left the artillery to serve exclusively in the medical corps. When he arrived at number three Canadian Hospital, operated by McGill doctors and nurses at Boulogne sur Mer, it was an outdoor tent facility at the mercy of the elements. And this, of course, was not good for the health of a doctor who had asthma. The move to an abandoned Jesuit college in 1916 made his working conditions more manageable. The long hours, his asthma, and the illnesses treated, in addition to the battlefield injuries, began to take their toll. 
he was appointed consulting physician to 1st British Army on the 24th of January 1918, just four, to day, four days before his death from pneumonia with complications of meningitis. Lieutenant Colonel McRae was the first Canadian to receive this honor. He's buried in the cemetery at Moubrou, France. The impact of McRae's in Flanders Fields was becoming apparent when he was still alive through the ever-increasing reply or response poems that were penned to symbolically continue passing the torch in verse. These tributes to his poem continued after the war, and David McRae, his father's scrapbook, his father, his scrapbook and the McRae collection of the Guelph Museums is filled with reply poems printed in newspapers from Canada, the United States, and as far away as Britain. The official Canadian response poem is by Frederick J. Scott, who is Canon F. J. Scott, uh, senior chaplain CEF. He was it was written in Quebec in December of 1920, entitled The Unbroken Line. It accompanied McCray's poem on a lot of commemorative pamphlets uh, for the Where the Poppy Fund and other various uh, commemorative campaigns and celebrations in the 1920s and later. And usually what they would do is juxtapose the two poems on a pamphlet of some, time, of some kind. They quite often have a bevy of poppies on the same uh, brochure or pamphlet, uh, quite often crosses, and in addition to that, they quite often had stylized ghostly figures of soldiers as well, or soldiers that had passed away. The official American response poem was an Ameri called The American Answer. It was by R.W. Lillard, and it dated, it dated from 1918. And like Scott's reply or response poem, it accompanied McCray's poem on lots of commemorative fly flyers that were distributed over the years. Much of the story of the poppy is an international symbol of remembrance and the role of in Flanders Fields in facilitating commemorative activities in Canada and many other nations really came after uh, McCray's death. McCray died a bachelor, dearly loved and greatly missed by his friends and, fam and his family. In 1919, a collection of McCray's poems was titled uh, In Flanders Fields and Other Poems. It was published posthumously and it became an international bestseller seller rather, and provided insights into uh, the psyche of the man and the imagination of the author of In Flanders Fields. Well, soon the poppy was a symbol of remembrance approved by the American, British, and Canadian legions. Canada and Britain held their first poppy day on November the 11th, 1921. And this was a year after the United States held their first poppy day. On Memorial Day 1919, a column called Peggy Shippen's Diary that appeared in the Philadelphia Ledger reported that U.S. President Harding was about to adopt the Flanders poppy as a symbol of gratitude to the, the dead and to the memory of the soldier poet of Canada. In Canada, the reading in Flanders Fields or the singing of choral arrangements of the poem it still continues to be a cornerstone of Canadian Remembrance Day observances in Ottawa. And you'll notice that if you watch the televised services from Ottawa. But it's also a ritual across the nation. However, the poppy now plays tribute to all Canadian War service since 1914, and not just exclusively the First World War. Bev Dietrich, curator, Guelph Museums, has an extensive knowledge of McCrae's personal history and how his famous poem and his memory have been honored in Canada and internationally. She knows that two women were instrumental in the poppy becoming a symbol of commemoration. In the United States, the Flanders Fields Poppy Memorial Fund was inaugurated in 1919 by Moyna Mitchell, or Moyna Michael, after she read a copy of McCray's poem in the Ladies' Home Journal. Michael was attending a conference of overseas war secretaries on November 9th, in 1919, and she saw the haunting image of the fall the fallen, those ghostly figures I've already described, hovering above a field of poppies and crosses that accompanied the reprint of the poem on a brochure. It inspired her to pen one of the many reply poems written in response to McCray's poem. She was complete, as she was completing the poem, three conference delegates came up to the desk where she was composing her own poem, and they offered her a check of $10 because she'd gone to great pains to arrange their accommodation in town. And she told them that she was going to purpose the money to buy 25 poppies and that they would be used to establish a poppy fund. 
The Flanders Fields Memorial Poppy Fund was born, and Miss Michael devoted all of her spare time to her campaign. Now, by 1920, the American Legion passed a resolution to endorse the movement to have the poppy adopted as the memorial flower of the American Legion. And uh, I was living in the States for a number of years, and poppies are very, very much front and center in commemoration ceremonies in the States long after World War I. Similarly inspired by the poem, a French woman by the name of Angerin uh, organized French widows and orphans to make artificial poppies for sale to earn money for their support because there were a lot of widows that were left fairly destitute after the war in deplorable conditions as the country such as France tried to recover. In 1921, Madame Guerin traveled to London, England to ask the British Legion for to purchase their poppies. At first, the Legion purchased the French poppies, but in time, the British saw the utility in using their own veterans who were injured to make poppies for their celebrations so that they could supplement the income of people who had been wounded in war. Bev Dietrich reminds Canadians that we too have our own poppy lady. Her name is Lillian Freeman, and she, quote, made poppies in the living room of her Ottawa home and sold them on behalf of war veterans, unquote. McCray himself has been memorialized at the Canadian War Memorials of in Ottawa, at Vimy Ridge in France. Belgium pays honor to McCray in his poem in many ways. There's a Flanders Fields American Military uh, Cemetery in Wermigan. A copper plaque was placed in St. George's Memorial Church in Ypres to the memory of McCray and the Canadian Medical Corps. And in this century, a new museum has been opened called in Flanders Field Museum, and that's a very exciting development in Ypres, Belgium. Following the First World War, stained glass windows were installed in a variety of places that were very dear to McCray, places such as McGill University, the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, the University of Toronto, and at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Guelph, Ontario. A plaque dedicated to McCray hangs in the Guelph Collegiate Vocational Institute where he went to school. Another local commemorative venture was the conversion of the home where McCray was born into a museum. The McCray House was a family home, and it didn't come on the market for sale to allow public purpose until 1965. Members of the community mortgaged their homes to fund a down payment and uh, took a great risk, purchased the home, and then led a fundraising campaign uh, that was mounted by a group that became known as the McCray Birthplace Society. And there was enough public support that they were able to keep that venture going. But it was a really a leap of faith for the people that mortgage their homes so that Guelph could now have this wonderful uh, museum that's part of an historic site. In 1983, the conservatorship of the home was rescinded by the Birthplace Society and assumed by Guelph Civic Museums. And in 2004, it was officially plaqued as a National Historic Site. Curator Bev Dietrich asserts that, quote, McCray House continues to hold the torch in remembrance of John McCray and those who died in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and peacekeeping efforts today. And so today we honor those who have served in Afghanistan and will continue to serve Canadian fighting men and women around the globe with the uh, same reverence and the same sorts of commemorations. Well, for the nation are celebrating the 100th anniversary of In Flanders Fields, and the Guelph Civic Task Force has been charged with planning this year's events. The people who have made up this task force include city staffers, the Guelph C City Civic Museum staff, and several members of the Guelph Civic Museum's Advisory Committee. Now, in addition to small-scale events and projects, two major showcase events were planned. Uh, one of these was the redesign of the interior of McCray House on Water Street, and the other was the installation of the McCray uh, statue on the grounds of the Guelph Civic Museum on Norfolk Street. The 100th anniversary of In Flanders Fields has facilitated the long-awaited redesign and development of the, the outdated display space within McCray House. With the exterior of the museum kept true to the decade of McCray's birth, residents after the McCray family exited the house have not, did not preserve the interior the way that the house uh, looked in the time of McCray's family living there. With reopening this week, Daily Tease and the commissioned theatrical production will utilize the beautiful gardens to the rear of McCray's house uh, throughout the summer. 
local playwright Don McCrae, in no relation to the McCrae family that I'm talking about, was chosen to write the play to be staged outdoors. Uh, Don McCrae has a wonderful reputation in the interior the theater community, and we're very lucky that uh, he took on this commission. The play that he's created is called The Night in Flanders, and it will be a feature of an inbound travel initiative offered by Tourism Guelph in conjunction with a group of a group travel company. A partnership with another group travel specialist will facilitate an outbound excursion to France and Belgium to visit Can Canadian Forces battlefields and one World War I commemorative sites. Uh, Bev Dietrich, who's a true authority on McRae, will be traveling with the outbound travel group and reservations are be take being taken now for people to accompany her on this trip. Now the second signature event is going to be the unveiling on June 25th of the installed McRae statue. The statue is going to sit atop a hill, a very steep hill that runs up to uh, the converted Loretto Convent, it's now the Guelph Civic Museum. Uh, the museum is adjacent to another National Historic Site, which is uh, the Church of Mary the Immaculate, and uh, the Church of Our Lady is a very well-loved and, and recently preserved historic site in Guelph. And so both the museum and this the church that's an historic site are on top of Guelph, which is generally referred to as Catholic Hill. And the Cray statue will be out in front of the museum at the top of this very magnificent hill uh, that uh, is very well seen from all directions when you drive into Guelph. Lieutenant Colonel Michael McKay of Guelph's 11th Field Regiment is on the local fundraising committee led by the Honorable William C. Weingard. No tax dollars will be used for the commissioning and installation of the Guelph statue. The redevelopment of the landscaping around the design site for the statue installation has also met with a very positive start with shovels and ground uh, back in October 2014 and is now in, under completion uh, moving forward to the dedication of the statue. I'm very happy to report that an angled row on row design that captures the imagery of the crosses row on row in McCrae's and Flanders fields will be on the sloping hill in front of the statue. The design has, has been created to create clear sight lines up the hill to the location of the statue. A species of service berries will dominate the row on row uh, design traversing the hill. And a decision was made to use native plantings and a wide range of wildflowers and also, of course, a very large swath of poppies. The red Remembering Flanders Fields daily propagated for this year by Guelph grower Dr. Gilbert Stelter. Dr. Uh, Stelter is a professor emeritus of the Department of History at the University of Guelph and he was actually my thesis supervisor a few years ago. And he, this his new brilliant red Daylily will be put into a demonstration plot garden near the statue and we're very, very pleased that he made this uh, contribution to the Flanders Fields at 100 celebrations. In addition to these big budget enterprises, small scale public events are planned for 2015. They include poetry contests and a special issue of the Guelph Historical Society's journal dedicated to the year 1915 and the legacy of John McCrae was launched last evening at a public event. A host of community partners submitted proposals to tie their events to the official calendar for the 100th anniversary celebration. So a lot of community groups are rolling out their own smaller scale enterprises as the year moves on. Several initiatives with Guelph support have succeeded. Tammy Adkins, the manager of Guelph Museums, has confirmed there will be a new McCrae stamp and the IFF at 100 Task Force was thrilled to learn that an application submitted for John McRae to be inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame in 2015 met with success and he was inducted last month with six other new members of the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. This was a tremendously uh, significant event as far as the City of Guelph and the IFF at uh, 100 committee members are concerned. Guelph the Nation will memorialize Lieutenant Colonel John McRae and commemorate the 100th anniversary of his fabled poem for this next year. 
It's fitting the statue chosen for remembrance in Ottawa and Guelph. I do not glorify war, as McCray himself acknowledged the tragedy of war in his poems. And this came out in other poems that he had, such as The Anxious Dead, and the other, another poem would be Disarmament. And these poems speak to the virtue of peace. McCray is depicted on a stump, looking pensively at the poem in his hand. He is not in full military dress, and the humanity of McCray is evident. And to me, the statue evokes all aspects of his complex personal history, soldier, physician, and poet. Okay, so this concludes my uh, presentation. I'd be very, very happy to entertain any questions about the celebrations in Guelph or about McCray or reflections on his poem. So I'd like to invite you to engage with me at this point in the broadcast. Well, Allenson wrote his retrospective with the fog of memory, but he was the commander of McCray. He was there when Alex's hammer was blown up. He was there. He names other people who he was uh, in companionship in, around McCray. When McCray was taking a break, he was sitting on a stump. He was off by himself, and various people watched him write the poem and also engage with him while he was doing it. So. I think that the, the myth of the how he wrote it in one sitting and deposited it very quickly and decided it wasn't worth publishing and discarded it is, is just that a myth. I have been working on a, a long-term project on uh, class and power and gender in Guelph in the late 19th century and the early Edwardian period. And you can't do anything on Guelph without bumping into the McCray family. I have been in, born in Guelph myself and uh, lived here when I was growing up. Uh, did my PhD in Guelph and then came back after 15 years in the States. You just don't live in Guelph with having some sort of familiarity with Cray. But uh, as far as a research interest, I, I just found the family fascinating because they were so integral to the early development of Guelph with the sawmill and the woolen mills. Guelph began as a very Scottish community. Uh, the Canada Company wanted moneyed people to come here, so they made the town sites and business sites, mill sites, very expensive. So you couldn't be a financial lightweight and come to Guelph at that time. By 1860, Guelph was very much an English town on Canadian soil, but the Presbyterians and the Scottish people in Guelph still were very important in the upper echelons of politics and business and uh, very much in the Presbyterian churches in town. And so I, my entree into Cray came through uh, other research and very much uh, I became very much ingrained in the issue of McCray. I've done a lot of work on the home front in, this, in Guelph and area, Kitchener Waterloo area, uh, for World War One in my uh, academic life and research life. And he very much is an important part of that story as well. And his dad was very much involved in the home front defense. Guelph was actually a military training center. And David McCray was very much involved in promoting that in the area. And Guelph was very, very pleased to be involved in that capacity during World War I. And Guelph was always called Gunnerstown. And this obviously led to looking at people like David McRae and his son John, because the local militia and military are very, very important features of the history of Guelph in general. There are some records, answering Paul, about Alex Helmer and the relationship with McCray in the archives at the museum. Uh, they became good friends. They're both from 
McGill, they were also serving in the same unit. Uh, Helmer was considerably younger than McCurry. I think he was a bit of a mentor and a friend. Uh, had been more or less looking out for him until this very tragic day that Helmer was blown up by the, the shell. And uh, there are records that do speak to that in the archives and also a lot of material on how, why and how the poem was created, which of course includes the friendship and the story of Helmer's very tragic death. Well, Linda and Paul are typing. I'm wondering if you can clarify for us, Deb, uh, which institutions are included in the umbrella term Guelph Museums? The Guelph Museums actually now has three component parts. There, of course, McCray House that I've been talking about extensively tonight. The Guelph Civic Museum, the converted convent, is the newest space for the Civic Museum, and that's where we're broadcasting this evening. We also have another addition. We've had a locomotive added as another historic site, and it was a locomotive that was more associated with World War II. It actually took four brides across the country, and it was acquired by a local railway enthusiasts here and restored very lovingly over the last five years, and it was uh, given to the Guelph Civic Museum, Guelph Museums, rather, in this past year. And so we now have those three component parts of Guelph Museums. This will be the final call for questions, so if you've been holding on to something until the end, now is the time to ask or to share. Uh, we welcome all comments and concerns and questions. At this time, I am going to share the survey for tonight's webinar. Uh, Deb, Before we have the final question, I just want to say that anyone that's interested in finding out about the events of in Flanders Fields at 100 can check with the Guelph Museum's website. We have a full calendar of events. There will be speaking engagements and military lectures, exhibits related to World War I and World War II, and we'd be very happy to have people check our website. As far as McCray's significance to the city of Guelph, I think people probably wonder why he's such a favored son here when he went off to U of T at age 16 and would come home to visit throughout his uh, academic and his uh, professional medical career and then in between war services. He's fairly much emblematic of the very proper young gentleman that this community was trying to produce in the late 19th century and early 20th century. He also is someone that Guelph is very proud of because the family is one of the founding families as far as enterprise and Guelph is concerned. And McCray and his brother really became quite famous with their military or with their medical acumen. And McCray's service is also something that's important. He interrupted his college days, his university days. He came home. He went off to war. Risked his life with a lot of local young men and the accolades that he got from his men and from the community were really quite impressive when he got home from war and of course notices came back about the service of the Guelph volunteers while they were in Africa he was met at the train he was swept up by the crowd and carried on their shoulders through town so he was a very much a hometown hero even as far as the Boer War was concerned we can't escape the fact that McCray has Im left an indelible imprint on the nation and on people who were allied with the Canadian forces and the, and the British during the 
First World War because his poem has become such an important institution as far as our commemoration and, and remembrance is concerned. And the reverence that's been shown and the respect that's been shown from McCray, both in our community and in the province and in our nation and beyond, is something that really cannot be overlooked. And so you really can't research the late 19th century and the first couple of decades of the 20th century without understanding how what an important figure he was to our community and to the world. And Linda, for your great questions. Um, I think oh, Deb will be sharing her email address as Paul has requested. I see down here. Perfect. Um, that is the end of tonight's webinar. Have a great night. Thank you for inviting us. You're very welcome.